Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started here in just a minute or so. If you could grab your seat, that'd be great. All right, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the PSPRS annual conference. Thank you all very much for, for taking some time this morning and, and coming and joining us and hearing what's been going on in the system over the last year. So much of our success that we continue to to have has a lot to do with all of you sitting out there. You're gonna hear some, some pretty exciting things that, that we've been working on over the last year. Uh, wanna welcome you to the new venue. For those of you that have been to these conferences for the last couple years, we, we finally outgrew the last venue, which is a, a compliment again to everybody and just the, the popularity of this conference. I remember last year there was some severe weather up northern Arizona and some of you that, some people are shaking their heads that that made it down for the day probably didn't make it back up that's that that same day so this year we didn't we didn't have that problem and then for those of you this is your first conference glad to have you join us and we hope that you'll find the program and the programming that we have um, educational and interesting to you we've got a, a buffet if you will of of different topics to cover throughout the day and some of it's real technical and investments and actuarial stuff and there's also some good information about for those of you, and I know a lot of you are here, are on the local board um, and all the things that that involves. So to introduce myself, now that I've kind of covered a little bit of logistics, my name is Scott McCarty, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Board of Trustees for PSPRS. And, and I use the word serve because it truly is a passion of ours to serve um, as a public servant. I've spent 35 years working in local government at various communities in Arizona and the state of Washington. And it's very powerful to be able to serve a community of 75,000 people or 250,000 people. But it's even more powerful to be part of a system like this where you're affecting tens of thousands of people and our members and the people that put their life on the line every day to protect us, police and fire and corrections officers. So the magnitude of what we do here is, is never lost on myself, nor the eight people that serve with me uh, as fellow trustees. <clears throat> I'd like to take a minute and just thank the PSPRS staff to put this event together is a tremendous amount of work. Somewhere between three and 400 of you are out there attending this conference, which is probably our largest attendance ever. But as you can imagine, the logistics of finding a venue and all the material and getting all the speakers together is awesome. So if you could join me in a round of applause for the PSPRS staff. So I always get the fun part of the job, you know, batting lead off and kind of setting the tone for the day. It's coming up on baseball season and I hope that our Diamondbacks have a successful over year this year coming up as, as they did last year. I was talking to Mayor Hall from Surprise, and although the Diamondbacks didn't win, at least one of the teams that spring train here out in Surprise and the Texas Rangers was able, to, was able to win the championship. And Mayor Hall was saying he actually got a picture with the trophy. So we're, get, we're getting close someday. Hopefully it'll come back to Arizona in the form of the Diamondbacks for their, for their second world championship. So with that and some opening comments, let me go ahead and just get into the presentation. And again, my job here right now is to set the table uh, for some of the breakout sessions and really highlight some of the things that have been going on at the system over the last year. Who is PSPRS? We are a, a system of about 60,000 members and retirees and beneficiaries across three separate defined benefit plans. Um, involves 250 plus employers. So we've got public safety, we've got corrections officers, and we've got elected officials. In addition to the DB plans, we've got defined contribution plans. Those continue to have evolved with the, with the most recent reform several years ago. We have a unique plan in the cancer insurance plan. You'll hear some highlights about that in my comments. And then I know there's some sessions later, uh, but that's a tremendous benefit to our members helping them deal with that unfortunate situation financially when they have uh, been diagnosed with cancer. And then we also have a health subsidiary program 
that we um, participate in along with, with ASRS. So that's a little bit about, about who we are. Um, before we get into the content of my, my presentation, just wanted to take a minute and, and pause and, and think about the people in the system that have given their lives for public safety. At the beginning of every meeting, unfortunately, from time to time, we have a moment of silence for members that actually died in the line of duty, whether they're police or fire or corrections. And in this particular year, um, Benny Ashley, who was actually one of the founders of PSPRS back in the 60s, uh, through one of the trustees, Brian Moore, we had a birthday celebration for Benny, probably about six or eight months before he passed away. He was 105 years. And this picture was the day that he came with his daughter to PSPRS and actually attended a meeting. So it gives you some perspective on, on the human side of, again, what we do. And then we have a slide here that just kind of memorializes a couple of uh, some feedback that we've got from some of our members. We had one of, the, of our retirees, a member that had some cancer, and, and the PSPRS staff stepped in and really made them aware of that cancer insurance program. That's one of the challenges we've had with that cancer insurance program. It's so unique to our system. Most people don't even know we have it. And in this particular case, uh, this member didn't know we had it. Uh, we made them aware of that, and then um, they were actually able to get some financial assistance to the program. And then the last testimonial there is from Carl Richardson. Carl Richardson, and Carl's one of our uh, people that's very engaged in what we do. And I've known Carl for several years. And here he took the time to actually thank us for one of the things we did when we had one of our members who had some fraudulent uh, fraudulent hack on their bank account. And you could imagine with some of our retirees and the demographic that they are and as old as they are, that's something that's very personal to them is when people get access to their checking account. So we were able to step in and, and help them out and, and do what we do as the system beyond just kind of the numbers and the facts and the figures. So a little bit about what works for us, and we're gonna go through this formula, if we will, um, if you will, as we go through the presentation today. Um, but it's a combination of all of these things that are really what's adding value to what's going on at the system right now. So it, for me, it starts with system governance. That's not only the, um, the board itself, but how we use our committees, and you'll see a slide on that in a minute. Obviously, what's a pension system without investments, and you'll, you'll get a little bit of that from me today, and then there's actually a session on that. And, Harry Papp and, and Mark Steed are doing a tremendous job with our investments. Everything we try to do at the system is really policy and strategic oriented. We've put a lot of time and effort into our funding policies. You're gonna see the results of that. The funded status of the system has improved tremendously over the last five or six years. Obviously with meetings like this, we try to increase stakeholder roles and, and ownership in the system. You know, we, we have a role as the board, the staff has a role, and you all as stakeholders have a role. And I think especially in the last five to 10 years, your involvement as stakeholders has helped push us and challenge us as a system and makes us better. And then we're making the day-to-day -day stuff better. So when you're interacting with PSPRS, hopefully whether it's a call or at the local board level, you're getting the response, the timeliness, and the uh, accuracy and the information that you need. So that's a little bit about what's working for us. I wanna take a minute right now and just acknowledge my fellow trustees. So I'll start with Vice Chair Harry Papp, who I know is here. Harry, stand up and we'll hold the applause to the end, but we'll make them all stand up together. Harry's the, one of the older ones, so we'll make him stand the longest and see if he can do this. Uh, Randy Stein, Randy, are you here? Rand, Rand, is Randy here? No, Randy's not here yet. Chris Hemmen, I know is not here, and Trustee Brian Moore, I know is not here. Dean Scheinert's here. Dean. Alan McGuire, I obviously know is here. There's Alan back there. Nate. Where's Nate? There's Nate. And last but not least, Darren Wonderly. So that's your board of trustees, minus a few who had some other prior obligations. And again, a big round of applause to these folks and the amount of time that they take. The amount of time that the trustees spend on the system, uh, working directly you know, at the board meetings and all the material, as well as the committees, uh, is a, a significant investment in their time and their effort. So a little bit about our committee structure. Um, I've spoken nationally on several occasions. I think 
this is one of the things that really has helped us get a lot better, a lot quicker over the last five years. And the four committees that I really think contribute to that are on the, are on the screen right now. The first is the advisory committee. So that was a committee that got created when we did reform, I don't know, six, seven, eight, ten years ago now. But that's a combination of employers and employee stakeholders. And they allow us, the board, to sort of assign certain hot topics, if you will. So if we're interested in some actuarial things we're dealing with or how something might affect the stakeholders, we use that advisory committee to really dig into the issue, get down in the weeds, if you will, and really wrestle with some of the options and ultimately make a recommendation about the, the particular issue that we're dealing with. That has helped out tremendously and again is, is a really good resource of some good decisions that we've made. Uh, Vice Chair Papp chairs the investment committee, so we have three trustees on the investment committee. They work with outside uh, consultants as well as the systems investment staff and do the investment things that they do. And again, Harry and Mark Steed, our CIO, will have a, an hour-long session later and I'll have a few uh, uh, slides on just high level, but the investments are performing as we expect in this type of an environment. The Divine Contribution uh, Committee is headed by Trustee Moore, who's not here, but we've seen a tremendous amount of increase in the amount of contributions in that, uh, those programs, especially related to employees when they, when they drop. So that provides them an opportunity to sort of self-direct those funds as, as they see fit. And then we have an operations governance and audit committee. Again, that's uh, three trustees that are on that. And they deal with a lot of the operational issues. So things that are going on to the local board, things in the governance, and things related to our audit, both external audit as well as we're, our internal audit function has increased here lately over the last year or so. So we're doing some employer audits and some other performance audits internally. So all of that stuff runs through the committee. These committees typically meet once a month and then we have our board meeting once a month. So if the trustees are involved in these committees, they're essentially meeting, they're taking their time for two meetings a month at least, let alone all the things that we have to do between the meetings, a meeting with stakeholders and, and staff and et cetera. So just helps to frame a little bit about part of our success, which is the governance of what we have going on. So stakeholders, this is absolutely critical and a huge focus for the system is to understand who our stakeholders are and what they expect from us and quite honestly, what we expect from them. So this is where we'll give you a little bit of chance to stand up and stretch your legs because it'll be helpful to see who of you in the room are what stakeholders you are. So any active members in the, in, in the room, please stand up. Come on, Darren, I know you're an active member. There you go. Okay, so we have the active members. Obviously, thank you all for your service to the system, the state of Arizona. And then this is the most envious group. So do we have any retirees or beneficiaries in the room? Unbelievable. They must be off doing something a lot better than this. So good for them. They're here in spirit though, right? And then the employers, I, I from... Uh, as preparing for this, we have 135 different employers represented. So whether it's staff, local board, elected officials. So if you're involved with a employer, could you please stand up? It's gotta be most a significant part of the room. Wow. There you go. Again, thank you for all your service. And then again, a unique element of our system is the local boards and their contribution to the system. So all of you that are on local boards, please stand up. Yes, thank you so much. The, the timing of what you do at the local board is so critical to delivering the quality service that our members and our, our retirees expect. Now, when I put this slide up, people give me a second look sometimes that the state legislature is actually one of our stakeholders. And it is true. You know, we're, we exist because of the legislature and we wanna have a really good relationship with them back and forth about 
how we can make the system better. You're going to hear about some legislation we got enacted that we believe very strongly makes the system better. Uh, the taxpayers, obviously, when it comes to the contribution rates of the employers, uh, directly and indirectly, the taxpayers are our stakeholders. And it's something that we're aware of in terms of um, contributions and funded status and the pressure that our decisions put on the employers in terms of contribution rates. And last but not least is ASRS. There's a, a significant amount of our retirees that actually get their uh, health retiree health insurance from ASRS. So we try to partner with them to understand the offerings they have for health insurance. And we'll talk a little bit about some uh, progress we want to try to make there to, to address ever increasing health care costs. So at this point, this is the part of the presentation where um, I think this is going to go really well and it's a little bit of humor. But the tie here is the importance of what we say as PSPRS and our dedication to the stakeholders is absolutely critical to us. This is a humorous take on, on that concept. But I want to take a minute and just really emphasize how important it is for us to listen to our customers as it's portrayed in this particular video. So if I click this button, this video should work. It's a little grainy, it's a little dated, but I hope you find it a little bit entertaining and can make the, the point that I just made about the importance of listening to our customers. At Roscoe's Oriental Rug Emporium, we're saying goodbye. We're closing our store forever, and you can save like never before. Roscoe's Oriental Rug Emporium is saying, that's it, it's over, we're done, time's up, farewell, so long, toodaloo, we're out of here. We really mean it, no kidding, this is really it this time. I know we've said it before, but this is the real deal this time. We're hitting the bricks, gonna mosey, gonna sashay, gonna clear out, bamboos, saying adios, ciao, vida zane, sarenara, au revoir, hasta luego, godspeed, until we meet again, which we won't, because Roscoe's Oriental Rug Emporium is closing for Ever. We're never coming back. It's over. We're done. We're shoving off, bowing out, flaking off, getting gone. It's at an end. We're cutting out, kaput, finish, drop the curtain, straight chance. It got better as it went through, but it, it underscores the point of our commitment to listening to people and really understanding you know, what customer service is. We've got to follow up on what we're doing and what we're committed to do. So thank you for that moment of diversion. Uh, so talk a little bit about stakeholder legislation at this point. Um, there's two things that as I look back on 2023 that I, I think were sort of flagship items for us. This is one relative to the tier two and the tier, or the tier one gaps, as we call them. And then the second was the, the progress we made on the cancer insurance plan. That's a little bit later. So the tier two, those are the employees that were between the tier one and then what we didn't know at the time, the tier three reform. So from like 2011 to, to 2015 or 16. And the way that, that that was originally set up is that the intent was for those people in that tier, and there was about 1,600 public safety members and about 7,400 court members, that the intent was that they would pay more than a fixed amount as an employee contribution. The tier one people pay a fixed amount of 7.65. This tier was set up to, to, to float a little bit, if you will, from 7.65 to 11.65 
based on the funded status of the employer plan that they were working for. And so the board did two things. One is we reinterpreted how that uh, float was applied to various plans. Prior to our reinterpretation, that was done at the t entire system level. So if the system level wasn't 100% funded, which it isn't, um, then the employers were, were not going to be able to pay that range between 765 and 1165. Even though within that plan, we had several uh, plans that were 100% funded. So under that situation, their employees should have been paying the 7.65, not the 11.65. So the board made the decision that that's how we were going to interpret how that range should be calculated. So that's the first bullet point there, where when we did that, and we went back and did that for the employers that were 100% funded, the employees got about $11.2 million one-time refund. So in other words, they were in a plan that was 100% funded. They had been paying the 1165. They should have been paying the 765. So through the employers, they got refunded. So I know, I know out in Queen Creek with our fire department that happened. And we had some employees that got checks between seven and $10,000 because that had been going on for several years. So the board made that decision, one time correction uh, to the employers or to the employees. Then what we did through the legislation is we said, we don't like this variable rates at the different employers. So the city of Phoenix and the city of Tucson, their chances of getting 100% funded in the near future are not very good. It's just too big of a system. Their employees are gonna be paying 11.65. And then you have some of these other communities where they're able to address their unfunded liability. So their employees are paying 7.65. So you have different members paying the different, different rates, although we're a system. So essentially what the legislation did is says, all the members in these in this tier two and tier one gap are gonna pay 7.65%. So for a lot of those, that means their contributions went from 11.65 down to 7.65. So on an annual basis, the first year we did it, that saved those members a little over $11 million, 11.3 million. Now that's annually. So essentially they got a 4% pay increase the year this went into effect and every year thereafter. So for us, um, again, paying attention to what was intended, how it was working, we just felt as the board that that disparity of employee contributions by our members was something long-term that we really didn't feel was in the best interest of not only the system and our ability to manage it financially, but also a fairness and an equity uh, decision uh, relative to the employees. So again, something that we're, we're really, really proud of in terms of how we worked with the stakeholders, we worked with the legislature, to get this enacted uh, moving forward, changed forever. Uh, another uh, legislative uh, initiative that we got through had to do with DC only participants. The legislation allows for some more flexibility for folks that are in that plan when they might get another job and allows them to basically reelect if they, if they move to a certain job outside of either where they're working or at the same location, but the job is significantly different. So again, trying to pi provide some more flexibility in tier three. And I think it's important to underscore, when you're involved in designing these tiers, whether it's the legislature, the staff, or the stakeholders, you can't foresee every possible situation that's out there. And I think our staff does a good job through the stakeholders and really through the members of getting items to us that just might not make sense operationally. And then we take a look at those and we try to deal with those strategically. And that tier three DC uh, legislation, I think is a good example of that. So shifting gears now to some new policies and practices, the tier three. So the tier three is set up such that the employee and the employer costs are shared 50-50. So there's a lot of sensitivity and awareness about how volatile those rates could be moving any one particular year, whether it's from the employer side or the employee side. We heard that and what we took a look at through our actuaries, we decided to kind of mitigate the volatility instead of recalculating it every year, just looking at one year at a time, 
we're going to look at that over a three-year period to take some of the sting, if you will, out of the potential volatility uh, and, and extreme movement from one year to the next. So we just started that. We'll keep our eye on it. If it doesn't work, we'll tweak it. If it works the way we want, then we'll, we'll keep going with it. But again, it just gives you an example of, of how we're listening to what's going on out there and trying to deal with volatility. So much of what, we, what we're concerned about is volatility. It's the employer contribution volatility, the employee contribution volatility, and then you'll hear later about investment volatility. Cancer insurance, this is the second of the flagship items that I think I'm the most proud of. This cancer insurance program's unique to us. We've, we looked at this for two or three years in different pieces and parts and, and finally made some changes this year to streamline how our members get paid, more of a upfront advance reimbursement once they meet the criteria for the insurance program. And then we also looked at the funding policy of what do we set the contributions at, how much reserves do we need, who's using the system, who's using the plan, how can we, how can we make it better uh, in terms of a financially performing plan. And we're getting ready to start some of those changes here coming up pretty quick. And then the last thing, and this is especially for those of you, if you're from the Department of Corrections or the cities of Phoenix and Tucson, this concept of the DC forfeited balances. So you have a lot of um, people that are in the DC plan are there because they work in the corrections environment. And it doesn't surprise me that these people don't choose to stay in the corrections environment very long, and they go on to do other things. Well, when they do that, they forfeit the member balance, your mem the contribution that the employer made while they were employed in that environment. And we can't, through the trust, give that money back to you, but what we can do is use that to reduce future expenses. So if you're Department of Corrections, cities of Phoenix and Tucson, and, and through the staff we're trying to reach out, these uh, balances are getting to be quite significant. And we want to make sure that these entities that have them know they're there, and we work with them to figure out how to reduce future expenses. So if that sounds like something that might be affecting you, Mike Smerick sitting right up here in the front, uh, please get a hold of a staff member and engage on that particular um, topic. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for employers to, to figure out how to use that and manage those unforfeited or those forfeited balances. Um, more things on uh, policies and practices. What's a good audit if you don't have another audit firm come in and, and, and audit your actuarial firm? So that's what we did. We actually had an actuarial firm come in and audit our existing actuarial firm. Sounds like fun work, doesn't it? Doesn't that just sound like a lot of fun? Um, and, and really what we got out of that was our current actuarial firm, Foster & Foster, is doing 99% of the things right. And essentially what the audit firm does, did is they replicated the calculations that Foster & Foster were doing and it came back that they're doing a really good job. There was a couple of recommendations that we've accepted and implemented, but nothing really uh, significant. We also did an experience study. An experience study is where you go in and you lay down your assumptions about payroll growth and turnover, et cetera, to what's actually going on and, and, and see how those line up and see if you need to make any changes with your experience study. And again, we, we did that. We do that every five years. And there was nothing uh, particularly um, drastic there in terms of what we're doing. Um, additional uh, investments, Harry and Mark will talk a little bit about this later, but as we continue to see, not so much right now, but over the last couple of years, the additional um, payments from the employers for various reasons. We really need to be smart about how we deploy that money. We've held a lot of that money in cash given the environment, and we are in the process of continuing to disperse that money. A couple other things I want to highlight and so I can keep moving. Um, succession planning at the system is really important. We've hired a couple of new hires recently that are in the upper management positions that will help for that. And then um, two, two last things, the sunset review, that's a review that's done by the state to make sure that the system should continue. So the good news is they came back and said that we're doing a good enough job that, that we get to continue and we actually don't have to go through another review for, for six years. And then the last thing that Mike's gonna talk about a little bit is just being more aware of retention and recruitment 
in public safety and how that may or may not affect the performance of the system. So, a couple of things. 5.3 billion, that's the additional contributions we've received from the employers, whether that's extra cash that the employers had or they did some kind of debt issue when interest rates were really low a few years ago, $5.3 billion. So thank you again for all of your efforts in that regard. Couple of number slides, um, aggregate funded status. You have the three plans, PSPRS, CORP, and EORP, and you can see pronounced improvements from the, the bar on the left to the bar on the right, looking at PSPRS that in basically four years went from, and this is aggregate, 47% funded to 66% funded. Again, a lot of that ties back to the, the 5.3 that I just showed you. This is an interesting slide that came to be a couple of years ago, and it helps to add context to the slide that just, I just showed you, whereas if you look at all 226 plans, PSPRS is 66% funded. But if you t start taking out some of our bigger unfunded plans, it shows you what their funded status really is. So this is important to the board. We have, like Phoenix, police and fire are two of our biggest plans. If, if we take those out, our funded status increases to 76%. And then if you take out the top 10 lowest funding plans, two of which are the Phoenix plans, our percent funded moves to 88%. So that tells us two things. One, there's a large number of employers, 206, that are doing a great job and really making a strong commitment to fund the system. And it also tells us that the top 10, we need to stay engaged with them. And these are the more complicated um, employers that we have, Phoenix and the state, Maricopa County. But from our perspective, we're trying to tell the whole story and just looking at an aggregate number of 66% is not enough. We need to be fair to those other employers that have made this a priority and that's what we try to do with this slide is provide the balance and we are making some efforts to try to work with those top 10 lowest funds. It's not an easy solution. If it was easy, it already would have been done and we completely understand that. So here's a little bit of the funding employer funding ranges. So if you look right there in the middle, um, there's a 43 orange bar. That's, there were 43 plans in 2020 that were 50 to 60% funded. And you can kind of see if you look at the graph how the blue bars on the right have gotten bigger. So contrast that to right now at the end of 2023, we had 67 plans that were 90% to 100% funded. So again, just another way to emphasize the fact that funded levels are headed in the right direction. Similar graph here with CORP, second set of data from the right. In 2020, you had no plans that were 100% or greater funded, or between 100 and 110. Now you have seven that are 100% funded. This is a little bit of a, a, this is a slide about the corollary, which is the contribution rates and how we try to manage those. The scaling here is a little bit hard to look at, but if you just look at PSPRS, you can see how we peaked at aggregate rates a little over 56%. We're now down to 46, and you can do the same thing on the corp. They peaked at 31% aggregate, and they basically cut that in half today. Okay, so there's a corollary there between as funded status goes up, contribution rates go down. The other program that we try to promote around uh, PSPRS is to make your payment as soon as you can to the system. Let us have that money, let us invest that money. If you have it in your treasury, we, can, we believe we can out earn you, if you will, and if you make a commitment to do that year after year, uh, we believe that's a really good practice to have. You can see we've had $600 million over the last four years that people have done that where they've quote unquote prepaid the system. Investment returns, go through this really quick. We continue to, to get a lot, um, deal with the volatility of the system. So what that means is in good times we might not make as much, but in bad times it means we're not gonna lose as much. So we're trying to again balance the effect on the member. Um, we, right now we have over $20 billion in investment and last year was 1.4 million in terms of, 1.4 billion 
in terms of the return. Uh, again, session later on all the details here, but this is the history of the interest returns. So much of this is dictated by the market, but it also is influenced by our strategy and the amount of risk that we take. And then here's the comparison. The blue is what we assume system-wide, the 2%, and the orange is what we've actually received over these different intervals. So what this means is the closer we are to what we assume, the less volatility there is in the contribution rates. That's what essentially that means to you. And you can see where the investment folks are doing their part to keep the contribution rates less volatile. Board priorities as I wrap up, manage the volatility of tier three. I've talked about that several times. We wanna evaluate the healthcare uh, options for our retirees. We believe if we can help address retiree healthcare costs, that helps add value to the retiree pensions, all of the things being equal. And then we've, the changes that I talked about with the cancer insurance plan, we've got to follow up on those and make sure we're successful in implementing those changes. So that's what we're doing for the members. For the employers, we'll keep working on unfunded liabilities with a primary focus on the largest employers, as I alluded to earlier. We'll maintain our active advisory committee We've got the actuary and modeler out there for you to help you do some uh, internal planning for your um, systems. Talked about the DC forfeited balances. And then the section 115, that's an opportunity for you to set aside money internally in a, in a trust to address PSPR, PSPRS costs if you're not comfortable sending that same amount of money to the system. We've, we have a tool for you if that's your preference. Continuing education and communication is critical. This event, we're out there, we go to GFOA, ACMA, the league conferences, the firefighter conferences, the police conferences, wherever we can get an audience, we try to find time for sessions. We're finding that to be um, very, very, um, an opportunity to have a good dialogue with people. And not only do we attend those events, but there's a standard list where we actually participate in the sponsorship and help defray the cost of the conference because we want to be able to, we want those people to learn about what we're doing at PSPRS. And then the last thing in terms of our priorities is improved reporting. So whether it's a popular report or looking at new ways to measure our financial success or as I alluded to earlier, doing some in internal audits. So we've been really successful. We're not resting on our successes as you can see. We've got some things that we're staying focused on. So I know I'm a little bit running late, as I always do. Thank you for, thank you for listening. Thank you for the video, paying attention to the video. Are there any questions you have before I turn it over to Mike? Anything I said that elicited a question? Okay, so with that, I'll introduce the system administrator, Mr. Mike Townsend. Mike has been with us for probably four, a, four years. I was gonna say a handful. So, uh, Critical to what we do, the board sets the policy, all the things that I talked about, but then we hand it off to the staff who actually gets the work done. So it's Mike, uh, his people, the outside consultants we have that manage our money, our actuaries, et cetera, et cetera, that really make the system work in addition to Mike and his staff. So Mike, I'll turn the time over to you. And again, thank you all for your time this morning and welcome and have a great day. We hope we, hope we get some good information to you today. Thank you.